Okay, Greg, I'm about to start the broadcast right now. Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Rusciutti, and I'm the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. Thanks for joining us today for the third installation of our Innovator Series, a virtual exchange of ideas. Today, we're featuring innovators in the food system. Um, mark your calendar, because June 10th, we'll be talking about innovators in sustainable finance, featuring Susan Gray from S&P Global Ratings and Nat Kramer from Advanced Energy Economy, and they'll be moderated by the Aspen Institute's Business and Society Programs, Nancy McGaugh. Again, check that out in two weeks from today on June 10th. In a moment, I'll introduce today's innovators. The conversation will be moderated by Kate Jaffe, who leads the work on the Aspen team for agriculture and the environment. She'll be moderating a short conversation with our two innovators, followed up by some questions and, audience, questions and answers from those who tuned in in the audience. So please submit your questions now uh, via the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. This week, we'll be speaking with Ben Detta, the CEO of Food Maven, Colorado-based company that leverages an efficient online marketplace and big data optimization technology to sell high-quality, local, oversupplied, and imperfect food from distributors, manufacturers, and producers to restaurants and institutional kitchens at a significant discount. We'll also be speaking with Derek Hoffman, a third-generation farmer in Colorado who runs Hoffman Farms, a family-owned and operated farm in northern Colorado. Derek grew up farming 500 acres with his father and his grandfather in the Johnstown area, growing barley, corn, pinto beans, and alfalfa. In 2014, working with his wife, Hanmei, Derek now runs a farm focused on small-scale vegetables where they grow over 60 varieties of vegetables. 
Welcome, Ben and Derek, and I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Ben and Derek, for joining us today. Uh, I'd love to start the conversation off um, by hearing from you, Ben, about the work of Food Maven, and you, Derek, about the work that you do on Hoffman Farms, and then we can dive into how you are connected uh, to each other and sort of the impacts that COVID-19 has had on the specific work that you both do uh, and on the food supply chain as a whole. So uh, Ben, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about Food Maven, uh, the work that you guys do at Food Maven and how you got involved. Yeah, absolutely, Kate, thanks for having me. Uh, so Food Maven is transforming the food system by making sure that all food's good with, used with good purpose. Uh, our food system is really good at producing massive amounts of good quality, low cost food and pushing it everywhere, uh, except it's really inefficient doing that, right? Uh, estimates are that 40% of food that's produced ends up being thrown away. Uh, this ends up creating over $200 billion in economic loss. Uh, you've got 70% of farmers are in the economic red zone, restaurants struggle on low margins, and 40 million Americans are food insecure. Uh, we're also seeing some other issues with that system as well, is that it can't react when there's a, a dynamic environment, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so the system, the reason that it is so inefficient is it does a really poor job of matching supply and demand, so you end up with lost food. This is product that's perfectly good uh, for use, but it can't be connected with a buyer in time. Uh, so it might be oversupply product where someone ends up with more than they expected or more than they can uh, move through their existing channels. Uh, it might be out of spec product. Uh, so it's out of a cosmetic spec. You know, we all hear about ugly fruit. Uh, it might be out of a packaging spec uh, or it might be out of a, a, a date spec. It's short dated uh, on it. Uh, and then you have a third bucket, which is local product that can't find large distribution. And they're looking for some way to try to get that distribution uh, to their local system. And so what we do at Food Maven is help create new pathways for that lost food uh, with our online marketplace and first and last mile logistics uh, to help make sure that all that food can get used with good purpose. And it connects with buyers in food service, uh, independent retail, and a lot of direct consumer companies, uh, meal kit, uh, other folks as well. Uh, at the same time, we have the goal that 20% of the product that we bring in, we uh, donate and support hunger relief, uh, which obviously is becoming a really important thing uh, today as well in the current environment. So uh, we have a, a network of local uh, nonprofits that we work with that if we can't sell the product for our sellers, that we then are able to donate it to them uh, in support of hunger relief. Uh, started here in Colorado, uh, and then we've recently expanded to uh, Dallas, Fort Worth and Texas as well. Um, uh, my background is I've been with a lot of different startups across a lot of different spaces, uh, but I've always really been attracted to mission driven companies. And so when I got a chance to, to meet the team and the leadership here at Food Maven, uh, it was just something I really wanted to be a part of uh, tackling a big problem like food waste uh, and doing so in a way that's, you know, a lot of innovation around data, around logistics and around uh, our, our go to market. Uh, and then just seeing the impact that we make on a daily basis, uh, whether that's with the, the, the chefs and the restaurants that we work with, uh, with the great uh, sellers and suppliers that we work with, like Derek, uh, or with our nonprofit partners. So uh, it was something I wanted to be a part of. Great. That's awesome. And that segues well into the other portion of this um, equation, which is the producers themselves. So. Derek, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about Hoffman Farms and um, including some of what you grow on your farm and, and maybe some of the background. You there, Derek? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. It looks like uh, I'm having difficulty with my internet connection here. It's dropped a couple times. So. No worries. Um. So I don't know if you caught, but if you could just go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about Hoffman Farms and and what you guys grow on your farm and a little bit of the background. Uh, yes. So thanks for thanks for having me and uh, apologize for the technical difficulties there. Um, yes, I, uh, um, as was mentioned, I grew, uh, my, my children are the sixth generation born here in Colorado, where I guess you could say Colorado natives. And I was a third generation farming here in Colorado, did commodity crops. And then um, uh, when I got out of farming, I, I took a career in education for over 20 years. And during that time, um, I had a very large garden, about an acre garden. And it was actually my wife's idea to start the business. Um, she just wanted to do to have something to do on the weekend, and uh, we started doing farmers markets. And within uh, a matter of a couple of years, we expanded very rapidly. We found uh, that there was a demand for local product. Um, uh, 
which when I when I grew up in the 80s and 90s, that, that wasn't something that was there. This is, a, you know, a, a recent phenomenon that people want this. And uh, um, and uh, so we expanded and uh, we're probably we're considered a mid range kind of farm. We're, we're about 100 acres. Um, so there's uh, I'd say there's considerably bigger farm farms than us. And then there's some uh, a lot of smaller operations than us. Um, but we've uh, kind of focused on wholesale um, uh, for the, the last few years. And we, uh, our primary crops have been melons and, and peppers, which grow real well here in Colorado. And um, we do, uh, it's about 60 varieties. Uh, it's a little bit of everything, but um, uh, acreage wise, it's melons, uh, peppers, and then followed by potatoes and onions. Great, that's awesome. Um, so it would be actually awesome too, if you could uh, speak to how Hoffman Farms and Food Maven are connected and the relationship that you guys have um, with each other. So uh, Derek, if you want to start by describing that from your end and then, and then we can turn to you. So yeah, so when we, when we started out, um, what we found uh, is, is that kind of breaking into the wholesale market, we, we grew to fit the customers we had and the demand there, but as we expanded, of course, we had more product and we find that getting into the wholesale market, um, like your, your national chains, your big grocery stores, things like that, it, it's a difficult process and it's uh, time consuming. Well, we started attending conferences to find a way to move our product and we actually met uh, Food Maven, uh, did a presentation there, it was three years, actually might even be going on four years now. And we really, uh, we connected with uh, their, their company, um, you know, uh, goals, motto, the, the food waste, which we were seeing even as a small operation, we saw that, that there is a lot of food waste in this country. And um, so just their, their ideals and things like that, we, we started the conversations. And um, over the last three years, we've actually been moving product through uh, Food Maven. Um, they've actually taken some to, to food pantration, uh, food pantries and, and donations, but they've also been reselling some of our stuff. So it's uh, um, actually opened another market that we couldn't break into as kind of uh, a distribution. And so it's actually uh, uh, helped a lot. And we've been building on that relationship for the, the last three years. So fantastic. Uh, ben, do you have anything to add sort of from your end of, of the relationship? Yeah. So uh you know, what's great with uh, Derek and Hoffman Farms is uh, that we're able to help each other out in, in some great ways, right? So on uh, one hand, uh, for us, the great part is they're a local supplier. And this is really not, we're not talking here of uh, necessarily oversupply or out of spec, but just a local supplier that uh, might find it hard to break into the larger distribution, which is really a sad thing because there's such a demand for local product, right? Uh, but it's just, it's, it's very hard to be able to find that and, and get it on a regular basis. And so that's where uh, I think we've got a great partnership. Uh, you know, we've been able to uh, get some of Derek's product into uh, places like Colorado College and University of Colorado Boulder here uh, and great restaurants like Four by Brother Luck, uh, which is a well-known chef here in Colorado. And, and that's been awesome. And then also uh, we're able to help out from, uh, you know, when they end up with that other side of it, which is the oversupply uh, or the out of spec product as well. And so both those things, uh, I think what's great is we're just helping to make a stronger food economy and community here in Colorado together. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think as a, I, I grew up in Colorado, so as a, a native Coloradan, it's it's great to hear that those sorts of relationships are, are budding and that you guys are working together. Um, Derek, I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit of the uh, uncertainty that COVID has uh, potentially created for you as a producer just in how much things have changed over the last few months and, and maybe speaking to your customer base specifically, has it changed um, over the course of the few months? And if so, how? Sure. So um, for us, um, what's really hard for uh, uh, people to wrap their minds around is, is that in Colorado, the, the growing season is actually a very short season. Um, we, you really figure Memorial Day to Labor Day is kind of your window and you have about you really have about two to three months to actually make your money for the year. And so you spent a lot of the winter off season uh, trying to plan for what you're going to do for the year. And we actually had made a lot of plans in the off season that um, we were actually going to reduce some of our acreage and, um, and vegetables and, um, and kind of try to focus on our main core customers. We have really good relationships with about six K-12 institutions here in Colorado and uh, two universities. And uh, we worked with two farmers markets. We, we actually supplied to two farmers markets and um, 
Um, we wanted just to focus on that this year, uh, try to find, build some efficiencies. Um, and um, so when we got into December and January, we actually already ordered all our seeds. We had everything in place. We knew what we were planting, what we were doing. And what was new this year is we actually have a very large commercial greenhouse operation, but its main focus is about developing and growing our transplants, um, what we transplant in the field. So it really, the greenhouse was dedicated to our field operation. What we had done this, this winter was to, and an ability to just to pay for utilities and employees is, is that we actually started doing a greenhouse production. So we actually were attending two winter farmers markets and uh, we were having actually good, to, good success at those markets doing leafy greens and some other items and, uh, and had a, a basically um, a cash flow, which for a farm in Colorado is tough to have year round when you have such a s small window to grow. So we had cash flow going, which was, which was a positive thing for any business. And what happened is, is that um, once you started seeing this in the news and um, you heard of different things happening, different places closing, and I think really what spurred a lot of concern was what was happening in Italy. Um, I think everybody saw that on the news. And so we actually were like, okay, what do we do? And um, so the winter, the, the winter markets actually closed. And for us, we're like, okay, what do we do with this product? And these things were growing. And we kind of, our decision at that point was to halt everything. So we actually stopped our greenhouse production. It's like, okay, we don't know what's going on now. We, this is, this is really, I don't think anybody knew what was going on. So it's like, okay, we'll, we'll stop. And uh, let's go ahead and just focus on our plan that we had in December. Let's get everything started. Let's start getting our seedlings started for the year. Let's just move forward as if this was a normal year. And that's what we continue to do. Now, hindsight being 2020 is, is that what surprised us uh, is, is that uh, how much outreach there was from different institutions we hadn't actually ever uh, talked to before. Um, we were getting contacted so much uh, from food pantries. Um, a lot of money came through the USDA in the form of grants and food pantries that normally rely on donations were actually buying up product. And um, it's like, oh, well, that was a mistake on our part. We should have continued our greenhouse operation because the demand actually skyrocketed. So there, there was a weird silver lining in, in what was going on. But moving forward, um, we've just focused on the year. Now, our customer base, as I was saying, was two universities and six K-12 uh, schools. And we're trying to figure out, uh, and, and this is what everybody asks us is, are the schools going to open? And um, what will it look like? Well, what we have found is with um, the Boulder School District, who we work with and have a very good relationship with, is, is that they're providing food and as well as the Greeley School District uh, via meal pickups. And they Boulder um, uh, normally didn't buy uh, bagged lettuce um, from local farms. It was uh, more efficient and um, for health, healthy health food safety reasons, they were actually buying from you know processing areas. And they were actually looking for that product. So again, it was like, oh, we stopped what we were doing to focus on the year when we could have continued and um, I've been supplying these places. So the, the, the outlook is, is what is gonna happen this fall when the harvest happens? And um, will schools open? Um, I mean, the, the K-12 and the two universities probably make up about 40% of our income. And it, it's like, yeah, there is, I mean, in farming, nothing's ever a guarantee. Um, there, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we live with that just, it's the nature of the profession. You know, we, we rely on things that aren't in our control, like weather, stuff like that. So you, you do the best you can. And um, with, uh, uh, you know, moving forward, um, another interesting thing that happened is, is that they did actually open the farmer's markets here in Colorado. And this past Saturday was our first farmer's market in quite a while. And, uh, we went back and looked at the records and it was three times higher than we've ever experienced. That was on an opening market. Um, that was a, that was a question. Will people even show up? And lo and behold, they showed up. So, you know, there was all, there, there's still a lot of questions. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but there's also a lot of positive signs. Um, the, the buy local has been, um, a lot of talk for, for years and we were seeing the conversations and we think we, when we started six years ago, six years ago, we hit the market at the right time. Hey, we got local product. And 
you know, and there weren't a lot of avenues for selling that stuff. But now, as this has happened, as communities have closed, um, as, as daily lives have changed, things have people have now been more focused on that local supply chain. So there, there may be signs of hope and more positive than what we were anticipating back in March. So, um, and you hope that continues. I mean, you, you just don't know. And, and, and that's, you know, that's tough for a lot of people is that I don't know factor. So. Right. Um, thank you. And, and I think it's really important and valuable to have um, that perspective as part of this conversation on the whole for people to hear directly from producers themselves and, and what's happening on farms and, and some of this uncertainty, but also fortunately some of these, you know, potential silver linings. So uh, Derek has a daughter who's turning six today, and he's also got a busy planting season ahead of him. So uh, Derek, we'll let you go and we can continue the conversation with Ben, but really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us today. And um, we wish you the best for the upcoming season. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. You have a wonderful day. Thanks, Derek. Yep. Awesome. So Ben, turning the conversation a little bit more to um, sort of the specifics of the supply chain, uh, I think many consumers, myself included, have questions about what's happening at their local grocery store um, or some of these larger grocery store chains, you know, when they might see things like beef and chicken resurface uh, or when they might be able to find their favorite pint of Ben and Jerry's. And so I'm wondering if you could give, from your perspective, a little bit of an overview of what's happening behind the scenes um, throughout supply chains to better help consumers understand what exactly is happening. Yeah, happy to. So I, I talked a little bit about this when I, when I introduced the company and what we do, but you know, our food system has really been developed to optimize for predictable volume through predictable channels. So this involves what type of packaging it gets, right? Because there's different packaging for retail that's going to consumers versus what's going to food service than what's going to more, uh, you know, industrial CPG type companies. Uh, it's a product configuration piece, right? There's a very big difference between a 40 pound, uh, you know, tenderloin primal cut versus the eight ounce uh, tenderloins you may buy at the store. Uh, and then also how it's being shipped, right? Uh, there's certain parts of the supply chain that are really made just to do you know, long haul trucking, large quantity, but then you have the other side that's the, the last mile, especially if you're talking anything that's a direct consumer. Uh, and, you know, while that was highly inefficient, created a lot of waste before as uh, on it, and that's what Food Maple was really made to do, to handle, you know, now we're seeing that any type of significant change in supply or demand or very rapid change, uh, the system can't adapt fast enough to it. And so what you then end up with is not an actual shortage of the raw material. You know, there's still, you know, for the most part, the same amount of produce, the same amount of beef, the same amount of chicken, um, but it's not in the right supply chain or it's not in the right packaging or product configuration that can actually get uh, to the end consumer. You know, we saw uh, some estimates were, you know, prior to all of this, about 50% of the consumer spend was, you know, grocery. And about a 50% was through food service, uh, restaurants and the rest. And then all of a sudden that goes almost to zero and then a large shift over here. And so that's what you end up on it. And what this thing creates are these uh, localized shortages and oversupply at the same time, right? Why you see, I can't buy chicken in the store, but then I see a story about how they're euthanizing chickens because they can't go through a process. And that, and that also was just uh, made even worse by the fact that in what I think is probably gonna be the more impactful thing long-term is the labor side of it, mm -hmm. right? So our food system became so centralized and specialized that there are you know less than 10 major slaughterhouses that are really dealing with all of your beef or all your pork or all your chicken. And so if you end up with a COVID-19 infection that ends up shutting that down, that essentially shuts off that part of the system for, good, you know, for a period of time, uh, which then creates these type of shortages. Uh, so I, I think that you, know, you are starting to see some of that come back, right? Uh, slaughter numbers are coming back up. So I do believe that you will start to see more consistency in what you see in the shelves. Um, but there's still gonna be variability, right? It might not be in the same packaging. It might be slightly different cuts. Uh, you're definitely going to still see some variance in the pricing with it is again. And, and that's just because this is, it's an inefficient marketplace. And so it struggles to match that supply and demand. And we're just going to continue to see that variability here, you know, really until everything uh, you know, settles down, right? There's a, there's a vaccine that we know that we have this under control. Yeah. So, so you're, you're speaking to kind of this mismatch, right? Between supply and demand. And, and so has, 
Food Maven adapted or are you in the process of adapting your, your business model to address and respond to that mismatch or are you guys having those conversations intern internally or how does that, how does this potentially long-term though, hopefully will be restored um, mismatch between the supply and demand? Um, how's that impacting sort of your mission and, and the direction that you guys are gonna take going forward? Yeah, you know, the solution we are trying to, that we've been building is an agile food supply chain, right? This idea that it can quickly match supply and demand and help connect those. And with food, of course, you're dealing with it with a time period as well uh, on it, with especially with fresh product. And so that's that's what we ended up doing in this situation. You know, we had a, a lot of our customers for food service. Uh, we worked with a lot of high end restaurants, hospitality, higher education. Well, obviously, you know, the vast majority of them have shut their doors uh, for the last couple of months. You know, it's now starting to come back a bit. So we saw that demand go away. Uh, but then at the same time, we saw a massive increase in demand, both on the independent grocery retailers that we work with, the direct consumer folks that we work with. And then we just saw in our local community, you know, there were people who were really struggling to get access to the food that they want, that they want and they needed. Uh, you know, as we talked about the beef chicken not being available in the stores. Uh, and we had all that. We had access to that. So what we actually did uh, was launch a direct consumer business, you know, thankfully, because we have a digital marketplace. We have an agile logistics system. We're very easy, easily able to stand that up in a couple of days. Uh, and now I've grown a, a pretty decent consumer business as well, where, you know, uh, consumers are placing orders online uh, for slightly different, but still bulk packaged and wholesale price products. And that's getting loaded up on the same vehicle that's making deliveries out to our business uh, customers and being delivered. Uh, right. And it's, again, making sure that all food is used with good purpose. So it's, it's been, I think, a great validation of what we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. But it is something that I think the entire system really needs to take a look at of what can it do to be more agile in the future? Because I don't think that this type of variation supply and demand is a one time thing, right? Whether or not you're looking at it from a uh, pandemic uh, standpoint or a environmental standpoint or economics, we want we need a supply chain that can be uh, more adaptable uh, and isn't so rigid as the one we have today. Yeah, well, that segues well into um, my next question, which obviously this is not the first time that a single event in history has impacted the food supply chain in one way or the other, and it's not probably going to be the last. And and you were mentioning, you know, Food Maven's um, goal is to create more of an agile system, and and I think part of that is probably uh, definitely addressing some of these fragilities that exist. Um, so in terms of a path to recovery and maybe one or two of the, in your mind or in your observations in the work that you're doing, um, some of these larger fragilities or even ones that are tangible that, that we should be working during this period of time to address, um, to kind of help create uh, a, a stronger and more agile system in the future um, and create sort of a new normal uh, moving forward. Uh, it, what, what do you identify as some of those fragilities? So it, what's interesting is there's definitely things on, on two different sides, right? There's parts from the consumer behavior side, where I think that there's a lot of changes that we as individual consumers can do to help create a more uh, flexible system and dynamic system. And then it's the actual system itself. And so I'll start with the consumer because I think that's one that might you know connect to folks more. But uh, understanding that you know we were part of the problem to begin with because we expected that we should be able to get everything all the time, anywhere we wanted and at a low cost. It created a system that, you know, optimized for that versus optimizing for uh, what else you need to have there. Uh, and then uh, the bigger part of it is uh, that we need to, you know, is the more that we can understand that there may be seasonality, there may be certain things that we can't get, uh, that as long as we're willing to accept that, that we can actually create a better system uh, overall, and one that's focused on more of a local economy and a local food community. Uh, with it, which is more adaptable, right? Because you're not dealing with, okay, all the lettuce that's grown needs to get shipped to California to get processed and come back. You know, as long as everything's working smoothly, that's great. But when there's hiccups, that's a system that can break very easily. Whereas if you're just going to a local network of farmers and getting what they have, it's much shorter logistics. It's much more uh, adaptable and flexible as it goes forward. Uh, and then from the system side, uh, it's a few things, like really trying to decentralize and distribute and not have everything focused on these individual one spots, right? One processing plant, one slaughterhouse, 
while that may optimize at one standpoint, it also gives you this critical point of failure. And that's what we're seeing today, right, is these, these points of failure. So what can we do to help distribute that back to communities, create local communities that are really self-sufficient, but then still connected, right, and data-driven. And that way you can still have that uh, economies of scale, but you do so in a distributed manner that really makes a, a better system overall uh, for everyone. And hopefully what it can also do is to help to drive that value through the entire process. Because I think that's the other part of this that the system has done is it doesn't drive a ton of value for farmers, uh, what we have today with so many being the economic red zone. It doesn't drive a ton of value for restaurants because they all operate on extremely thin margins. Uh, and, and there's so much waste that's driven, right? And so much lost value there. So what can we do to create a system that really is more of a win for everyone involved as opposed to what we have today? Yeah. That's great. Um, so then one more question before we turn to some questions from the audience. Over the past two or three months, um, since this has all taken over, um, what have you have you heard a story or experienced firsthand a story that you think indicates, you know, Derek was talking about some of these silver linings or these bright spots and, you know, the farmer's market being full of people who want to buy locally. I'm wondering if you could highlight or if you have on top of mind um, sort of a bright spot that you've observed that that's come out of this that maybe can give people a little bit of a, um, a flicker of hope moving forward, you know, among some of the chaos. Yeah, for sure. I think there's been, uh, to Derek's point, a, a lot of, there, there still is the demand here, right? This isn't like that's been a complete loss in demand. It's just that it completely shifted. And so what you did see was a lot of fo local folks that maybe have been struggling and not doing well before, all of a sudden now uh, can do a lot better. So whether that's your, your, lo your local butcher shop or a uh, local caterer or direct consumer company that now there's a, a much larger demand for what they're doing, whereas before they were starting to lose out to more of kind of the big business in what's in there. Um, I think another positive has been is because of the struggles of the uh, larger food system to maybe meet some of these needs that some of the retailers have, you've seen retailers more open to working with smaller suppliers that they haven't before because that's their only option. That's the only place that they can go uh, get that product. And I think that's, you know, whether or not that continues afterwards uh, is gonna be really interesting, but hopefully they see that there's value in actually diversifying uh, your supply chain and having more folks that you work with and having some more flexibility of what type of product you bring in because it gives you a more resilient uh, business overall. Yeah, great. Uh, so turning over to some questions from our audience, which um, by the way, if you have a question and you'd like to submit it, you can use the Q&A function um, on Zoom to submit one. Uh, so the first question, um, given, and I think this is actually perfect for, for some of what you guys are working on doing, connecting food to where it's needed, but uh, given more rural and remote communities often don't have the infrastructure to receive larger food donations and then distribute it, but still experience unprecedented food insecurity, what are some ways in which innovations in the food system can address this disconnect? It's a great question. One that's obviously a, a, a big concern, especially right now, right? So many people are struggling to be food secure. And I think here, this is again down to building better food communities and food economies uh, on it. And what can you do to help find the nonprofits? Because uh, really that is the best way to ultimately meet that. But those need to then connect, get connected with the other side of the equation is the folks who can help them get food and help them get donations uh, monetarily as well. And there's some really interesting things that can be done, uh, you know, through the, the USDA food box program. You know, we actually got connected with folks in the Civil Air Corps who were going to be able to potentially do uh, fly in and drop boxes right in some remote locations uh, on it, including, you know, uh, some uh, reservations and other places that po folks don't necessarily always have access to it. And so I think that the possibilities are there, right? What we just need to do is help to make those connections and understand, okay, how can we uh, build a stronger, more resilient community than what we have today? Yeah. Uh, Cassie asks, what role does storage play? What alternative opportunities to preserve food might we cultivate to prevent waste in the future? So maybe you could speak a little bit about the storage component. Sure. Uh, you know, so on one side, we're actually really good at this already, right? Um, you know, if anybody has seen in some of the news, they talk about the fact that there really is no protein shortage because there's so much that's in cold storage. And protein actually is something that if you, as long as you keep it frozen, you know, below zero, it is good for a very, very long time. 
Um, probably a lot longer than most of us are maybe necessarily used to on the consumer side with it. But this is another way place where the change in consumer behavior, this idea that anything frozen is bad, is not necessarily true, right? Um, if you ask me, I'd rather have something that was, you know, uh, processed or produced fresh and frozen immediately than something that's been fresh for the last, you know, week and a half and moving back and forth in that in that uh, configuration. And so we're doing really well on that side on the frozen piece. I think there's obviously some uh, additional innovations that are happening. Yeah, you know, there just was a uh, appeal is uh, one of the businesses out there that they just had a massive raise of funding yesterday. And they're doing some really neat things around coatings to help keep produce uh, stay fresher. And, and there's other uh, stuff along that along packaging as well as what we can do. Um, but, you know, absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the storage side to continue to make it. But there's also good things happening right now that we just need to take more advantage of and be more willing to accept uh, on the consumer side. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this is a question a little bit more specifically about Food Maven and sort of who you partner with and, and maybe the operational side, um, asking who you partner with for delivery of produce, or do you have your own delivery network, or how do you operate on that on that side of things? Yeah, so that's one of the things I think sets us apart is we do our own first and last mile logistics. Uh, and, and that was something that we really kind of made the decision that we we had to do in order to make our business model work. You know, we need to be able to identify lost food get it to our warehouse and up onto our marketplace within 24 hours. And then somebody can place an order. We have to deliver it next day. So that ability to move that quickly, uh, especially uh, keeping in mind food safety and, and having your cold chain as you go through it, um, that doesn't really exist as a third party service uh, on it, right? Most third party logistics, uh, if it's refrigerated, you're talking much larger vehicles and, you know, it takes time to schedule. Uh, or if you're talking more on like the restaurant delivery side, you know, you're, you don't have the, uh, the the cold chain with that piece. And so we actually have our, our own fleet of uh, refrigerated sprinter vans uh, and box trucks that we uh, leverage to be able to do our first and last mile logistics, which helps us, you know, being able to have that agility that we need uh, to move the type of product that we interact with. Great. Um, so uh, you as a company have taken on sort of this really important mission, I think, of, you know, eliminating food waste or helping helping to solve that problem. Uh, somebody's wondering, do you think that um, in light of COVID, we will see more companies, um, food companies in particular, um, and companies broadly take on a social mission for for example, advertising um, for reduced plastic waste or reduced, you know, food waste or whatever it might be. Um, do you think that this might spark uh, some of those missions to, to move forward? I, I hope so. Uh, you know, before all of this, we were definitely seeing a drive from the consumer of companies to be more sustainable and have real measurable impact that they make, because that was the type of brands that folks wanted to associate with. Um, and, you know, I think one of the negatives of the situation we currently are in is it's actually taking people a bit back from that because now it's just about, I just want access to food, right? I'm worried that I can even get it, not necessarily kind of that added piece to it. So I do hope that what we can do is, you know, show that there isn't an issue with access to food and then get back to it because the, sustain the, the sustainability piece of it is what helps make this truly more flexible and, and more resilient on it because sustainability means not just, you know, what we may think from an environmental standpoint, but from a standpoint that this can actually continue and grow and do so in a way that creates value for everybody. Yeah. Uh, on that. So I, I do hope that that does help to, you know, that we get back to the, the path we were on before and potentially even accelerate that, you know, based on what we've learned in the past two months. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Uh, and then I think we will close um, with a question that I think is a good one to end with. Um, you, uh, you addressed this a little bit earlier, but maybe you could um, elaborate a little bit further about anything that consumers should be doing um, or how they should be thinking differently. Uh, just general advice you might have for a consumer um, at, right now and moving forward into the future. So I always like to start with, you know, engage with your community, right? Find out who are the local growers, uh, who are the local restaurants that are still doing delivery, still doing uh, takeout and, and and help to support them, uh, right? I mean, because ultimately, the more we support our community, the more that they can support us uh, in the long run with it. And that includes your nonprofit partners and everyone else. Uh, the next part to it is, you know, definitely question maybe some of the, the long-held beliefs that you have of what you expect for food. 
right? Uh, you know, there, there can be a real joy in seasonality and only having certain products at certain times or in limited amounts and, and being more creative, right? The, the constraints around what you have access to can actually lead to some really incredible meals and some really incredible uh, food with it. And I think if we can change our behavior, that will help to eliminate some of the bad behavior that the system created because they're trying to serve us. Right. And so mm-hmm. having that understanding that that can be uh, a great way to, to actually build a better relationship with food, and a better relationship with your food community is another thing to look at. And then uh, the last one is, you know, don't let go of the what's important to you on the sustainability side and, and, and really having brands that you work with and companies that you work with that have a mission and care. Um, it can be a little hard right now with the situation that we're all in because we have so many other concerns that we have. You know, we're down to kind of that base level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but don't forget that higher purpose as well, um, because those are, I think, a lot of the companies that are helping to do uh, things that really are sustainable and help to, to really help to create value for everyone. And we want to, again, make sure that we get back to that uh, as we really kind of stabilize the situation that we're currently in. Yeah. Well, I can say my husband and I have definitely been getting more creative in the kitchen as we've been, you know, not able to get everything that we want every time we go to the grocery store. So I would, I would definitely emphasize that particular piece. Um, Ben, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today on this really important topic. We really appreciate um, the time that you took and, and would like to thank Derek again as well. And also really appreciate all the work that you're doing at Food Maven um, to promote such a really important Uh, component of the food system. And we really want to thank you. And to our um, viewers, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, for this week's uh, series on innovators in food systems. And please join us two weeks from now on June 10th at the same time to talk about innovators in sustainable finance. Uh, Thanks again, Ben. Thanks so much, Kate. Have a great day. Take care.